Hi, everybody. Is the, uh, is the mic on? Is it working? OK. Um, my name is Brian Fishman. I am a, a counterterrorism research fellow here uh, with the New America Foundation. Um, and with us today is Stephen Tankel. Um, Stephen is a uh, professor up at American University, he teaches a variety of, uh, of courses looking at terrorism, American policy. Um, he got his PhD at King's College in London. Um, and uh, and uh, has, is one of the world's best experts on Lashkar e Taiba, um, if not the best. <laughs> um, and we're really excited to have him here today, um, especially at this moment that I think is particularly um, prescient uh, because uh, we stand here today at a time when the United States relationship with Pakistan is more strained perhaps than it ever has been. And there are a lot of questions by uh, both counterterrorism specialists, but also the foreign policy community at large, about uh, how bad that relationship can get and what it means if that relationship does get extraordinarily bad. Um, and hidden in that is obviously Pakistan's nuclear weapons, but also its relationship with a variety of militant organizations, whether it is uh, various Taliban organizations in the Fatah, whether it is Al Qaeda, uh, and Osama bin Laden's presence not far from the Pakistani Military Academy, or uh, the Pakistani ISI's longest and perhaps deepest relationship with a militant network, meaning lashkar e -Taiba. What does that relationship mean going forward? What does it mean for U.S. relations with Pakistan? Uh, so as we go forward, uh, I'm going to try to stay out of the way as much as possible uh, and turn it over to Stephen. Um, we, he will talk for half an hour, maybe a little bit more, um, give us sort of a, a take on where LET is today and how we should be thinking about it. Uh, and then we'll ask questions. When you ask a question, please stand up, uh, wait for the microphone, and uh, announce your affiliation just so we all have a sense of where you're coming from. And with that, Steve, please. Uh, Brian, thank you very much. Um, and, and my thanks to the New America Foundation for having me here. Uh, the, the question that uh, we sort of, you know, posed for, for this talk today was, uh, is Lashkar Taiba poised to become the new Al Qaeda? Um, and I, I think that's, you know, an interesting question to, to ask uh, and provides a, a means for exploring the group for several reasons. And I think it's also particularly important because in answering that question, it tells us a lot about Lashkar's relationship with the Pakistani state and what we can and cannot expect the Pakistani state to do um, about that group. Now, it's also a question that I, I touch on uh, briefly in, in the conclusion uh, of, of my book, um, which I, I thank New America for, uh, for, for selling out there. Um, and it's, it's one of the most common questions that I've been asked about Lashkar. Uh, since I, I've given talks in which I discuss the group's evolution over the 20 plus years, um, which is the main subject that, that I've written about, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to devote at least you know, sort of one of these talks uh, to the Lashkar al-Qaeda question. Uh, I also knew um, that I wanted to do an event along these lines at, at New America Foundation, um, which has been kind enough to publish some of the shorter pieces that I've written. And it seemed the perfect place to discuss this particular question for t for, because it's, it's home to some of uh, DC's foremost experts uh, on al-Qaeda. I'm sitting next to one of them. Um, and it launched the AFPAC channel, uh, which has become sort of the go-to for people interested in updates and analysis regarding uh, that part of the world. All of which is uh, a long way of saying, once again, I'm, I'm very grateful to you guys for having me here today. So, is Lashkar e Taiba poised to become the new Al Qaeda? Um, I would argue, in Lashkar's present incarnation, the short answer is no. Um, but that does not mean it poses no threat to Western interests regionally in South Asia uh, or globally. Uh, and I'll touch on that as I, I go through the course of my talk. And the other uh, stream that you'll see running through this, the other important theme will be uh, sort of Lashkar's relationship with the state uh, and how that checks its ability to become sort of the, the you know, the new Al-Qaeda as well. Um, and I want to do five things today, and I'll do them as briefly as I can. Uh, the first is, you know, I want to focus just on Lashkar as an organization, as well as the strategic environment in which it operates, um, because it is a unique organization, and I think it's important to understand it as such. Second, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge those areas where one can ana analogize Lashkar to Al-Qaeda, since the question of whether the former is poised to replace the latter doesn't come from nowhere. Uh, but in doing so, I'm going to try to unpack those similarities to show that when one takes a nuanced view, there are important distinctions between the two. Third, I'd like to delve into the factors that I believe restrict Lashkar from displacing uh, Al-Qaeda as the leader of the global jihad. 
and here I should be clear that for definitional purposes, I'm talking about Al-Qaeda Central, not its affiliates um, in the Arabian Peninsula or Iraq or Islamic Maghreb. Um, not to ruin the suspense, um, but, but in terms of those factors that I'm going to talk about, um, you know, as I suggested earlier, I, I'm going to argue that Lashkar's relationship with the Pakistani state, um, in particular, as well as elements of its ideology, serve against, as a check against that happening. Uh, to do all of that, I'm going to be pulling from, from research that I did uh, for my book, and, and some of that might be familiar to folks here. Uh, from there, I want to delve into a, a, a fourth point, which is the ideological and organizational competition that's going on between Al-Qaeda uh, and Lashkar Taiba today in Pakistan. And there I'll be pulling on research that I conducted over the summer. Um, finally, I'd like to conclude by discussing briefly what this means for Lashkar and the threat it poses. And I think that'll serve as a good jumping off point into discussion. So uh, point one, understanding Lashkar and its strategic environment. And forgive me if this is an old hat for some of you. Uh, I, I think it's important just to begin by discussing the, the two ways that we can comprehend the jihadist milieu in Pakistan. The first is by sectarian orientation. Uh, most militant groups are Diobandi, as is the Quetta Shura, the Afghan Taliban, uh, Tariqi Taliban Pakistan. Lashkar-e Taiba is an Ali Hadith organization. The Ali Hadith are Salafist in, 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 in orientation. And so there is competition between those two, the Ali Hadith Lashkar and most of the other Diobandi groups. Um, and so Lashkar has never been as close to the Taliban as have most other militant groups in Pakistan. Secondly, um, we can comprehend the jihadist milieu by loci of operation. Now, historically, pre-9-11, there were three main areas for operation. The first was fighting in Kashmir uh, or supporting terrorist attacks against India. The second was Afghanistan. The third was sectarian violence in Pakistan. What's important here is that Lashkar was uh, involved only in operations in Kashmir and in supporting attacks against India, whereas the Diobandi groups were active in multiple loci of operation, um, in some cases all three of them. Okay? Um, post 9-11, uh, those loci still hold some utility, but I think it's important just to note that the Kashmir conflict has declined. Uh, attacks in India, with exceptions of major ones such as the 2008 Mumbai attacks, are primarily done by homegrown actors with some assistance from Pakistani groups. Meanwhile, Afghanistan is a place where every group is now active, including Lashkar -e Taiba. Sectarianism has become part of a revolutionary jihad in Pakistan. That's a new loci of operation. Uh, groups have now added the near enemy and are fighting against the Pakistani state. So that's a fourth loci. And then a fifth would be the addition of global jihad. And by global jihad, I mean uh, launching out-of-area attacks against the U.S. and its allies. It's important to note that the biggest divide um, is no longer the sectarian one between the Ali Hadith and the Diobandi, though that still exists. I would argue the biggest divide today is between those who engage in violence against the state, revolutionary jihad or sectarian attacks, and those who don't. Um, and here it's important to note, as some of you are no doubt aware, that Lashkar remains one of Pakistan's most reliable proxies and has benefited from copious amounts of state support over the years. So it's not surprising that it falls um, on the side of groups that are not attacking the Pakistani state and are not engaging in sectarian violence. Now, a little bit about Lashkar. Um, briefly, to me, to understand uh, Lashkar -e Taiba, one needs to understand the two dualities that define it. First is that it's a missionary and a militant organization, which is to say that its leaders lend equal credence to Dawa and Jihad. And on the missionary front, it, prefer, it pursues a reformist agenda um, that aims to purify Pakistan via Dawa, i.e. non-violent activism, um, and the conversion of its population to Ali Hadith Islam in order to create a true Islamic state. So it wants a revolution, but it's pursuing it non-violently. And it's channeled much of the state support that it received over the years into building up not only its military capabilities, but also a self social welfare infrastructure run um, under you know, its above ground organization, jamaat u uh, So that's sort of the, the, the missionary side. And I think it's just important to note that 
When I was there this summer, a lot of people spoke about the expansion of JUD uh, in Pakistan. Numerous interlocutors suggested that it was seen to have, quote, very powerful backers who are interested in promoting its growth um, in Pakistan. I'm going to come back to this later, uh, but, but there, the, the presumption is that one of the reasons why LET's growth uh, in terms of the, the JUD above ground footprint is being promoted in Pakistan is that it's a means to check some of those other groups. Uh, expansion who are anti-Pakistani. The second duality concerns its military activities in that Lashkar is both a pan-Islamist outfit and a Pakistani proxy. Uh, ideologically, it places an emphasis on the recovery of lost Muslim lands and the defense of Islam uh, throughout the world. That's a very universal agenda, right? Um, that said, liberating Kashmir and then all of India remains Lashkar's primary focus uh, its leaders believe India is an unnatural entity, that it will fracture under pressure. Uh, so that r remains sort of the most important front for them. That said, as the Kashmir Jihad has declined over the years uh, and the Afghan insurgency accelerated, Lashkar became involved in that front as well. Now notably, as many will know, since 2001, Indian influence has increased in Afghanistan too. And here it's important to note that Lashkar's pan-Islamist priorities overlap, um, as should be clear, with the army and the ISIs, and you'll forgive me if throughout the talk I shorthand them, there's says the, the PAC mill, um, with the PAC mill's interest in checking Indian hegemony. Okay, so we get that overlap of pan-Islamism and Pakistani you know, proxy identity. As I've mentioned, Lashkar leaders abjure attacks against the near enemy. It's one of the few groups that has not turned on the state or birthed splinter groups that have done so. Um, and as I said, evidence suggests that it serves as a check against some of those militant groups that are at war with the state. So it provides domestic utility, domestic security utility to the Pakistani state as well. Now, if you think that at times Lashkar has had trouble reconciling these dualities, you'd be correct. Um, indeed, I, I argue in my book that since 9-11 has it played it, its own double game. Uh, Pakistani proxy and social welfare provider on the one hand, and contributor to the global jihad uh, against the US and its allies on the other. Uh, doing so arguably has helped it to remain intact, as well as to remain in the good graces of the Pakistani state, because the global jihadist activities are done clandestinely um, and take a back seat to the Pakistani proxy role. Uh, but it's inevitably created tensions within the group, uh, which appear increasingly to focus on the issue of whether or not to engage in attacks against Pakistan. This has implications, as you might imagine, in terms of Lashkar's need to seek other outlets for jihadist aggression. And I'll discuss these implications in greater detail in my concluding remarks. I think it's, it's helpful just at this point to, because we are talking about, you know, is LET poised to replace Al-Qaeda, right? It's this group with universal ambition. It's Salafist. Um, it's, engaged, it's participated in the global jihad. Is it poised to become the new AQ? So I'll turn to sort of the, the second part of my talk, which is analogizing uh, the two organizations. First, yes, they are both Salafist in orientation. But it's important to point out that whereas Al-Qaeda's leadership traditionally has taken, I think it's fair to say, more of a pragmatic, um, big tent approach and sought alliances with the Obandi militants, most notably the Taliban and TTP, uh, Lashkar is much more doctrinaire in its Salafism and doesn't want to mix with them for theological reasons. It doesn't mean that collaboration doesn't take place. But there's what I would term much more you know, separateness uh, than, than necessarily togetherness. Second, both are admittedly pan-Islamist. But Al-Qaeda prioritizes global jihad against America and secondarily its Western allies, as well as embracing revolutionary jihads against Muslim governments, including the one in Pakistan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Lashkar is much more about classical jihadism, which means it's fighting to liberate occupied Muslim lands. Okay. Um, and most importantly, India is the main enemy, not America. This is partly due to ideology, but it's also the result of the fact that the leadership retains an element of nationalism that is distinctly at odds with Al-Qaeda. And here again, important to note, Lashkar refrains from attacks against Muslim regimes in general and Pakistan specifically, understandable given the significant state support it received over the years. Third, um, both have a stable of hardened militants known for their operational and tactical acumen. Um, and just as AQ was known partly for the level of instruction it provided in some of its camps during the 1990s, 
Lashkar today is considered to have among the best trained militants, as well as uh, to boast a cadre of high-level trainers, uh, best trained militants in Pakistan, I should say. And that's no surprise, since some of those trainers are former uh, Army and ISI. Fourth, uh, both Al-Qaeda and LET have what could be defined as affiliates, which give them operational reach. For Al-Qaeda Central, this is, you know, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is one, Al-Qaeda in Iraq is two, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is three, and it works with associated groups as well. Um, the Indian Mujahideen, which is an indigenous jihadist network in India, could be said to be an affiliate of Lashkar Taibas, which also has worked through various local actors in Fatah and Northeast Afghanistan. The nature of these affiliate relationships, however, is quite different, and I think it's worth exploring them for just a moment uh, because of what they say about the group's strategic approach. AQC has affiliates in part as a, as a result of an accumulation strategy. It wants to have an overt global presence such that its name is linked to operations in different theaters. Organizationally, these affiliates have pledged an oath of allegiance to al-Qaeda's emir, and they're expected to abide by certain rules upon joining. Uh, as Leah Farrell noted uh, in her you know, foreign affairs article, these include rhetorical unity, the inclusion of global jihadist targets in theater, and a promise to seek approval before operating out of theater. In contrast, Lashkar has used the Indian Mujahideen as a vehicle to strike India without its own name being attached to the attacks. Indeed, although the IM is far more lethal as a result of Lashkar support, it's questionable whether its leaders would have considered the network they led as a Lashkar affiliate um, to begin with. As to those groups in Fatah um, or in Afghanistan, their purpose, again, was to allow Lashkar members to fight in Afghanistan while providing the group's leadership with plausible deniability about its presence on that front. So whereas al-Qaeda is seeking uh, to have its name attached globally, Lashkar is seeking plausible deniability in terms of its actions. Um, fourth, uh, and I'm just going to touch on these briefly, uh, you know, but I think it's important to note that both have uh, robust transnational networks. In Lashkar's case, this means South Asia, the Gulf, Australia, Europe, and North America. Now, Lashkar has used those for attempted attacks against Western targets. I'll talk more about that in my concluding remarks. Um, but primarily, it's used them for fundraising, propaganda, or to support attacks against India. Indeed, it's hard to imagine al-Qaeda using David Headley, the Pakistani-American responsible for all of the reconnaissance in the 2008 Mumbai attacks, for an attack against India. They would likely would have used him for attacks against America. Um, some people might be thinking, yeah, but Lashkar also sent Headley to Denmark, right, um, to pursue attacks there. This is true, uh, but as those who followed the David Headley case would know, Lashkar also put that a, that operation on permanent hold as a result of ISI pressure, which speaks to the degree to which it can be influenced by the Pakistani state. Now, in other fora, I've discussed um, what the, the, the Danish plot meant in terms of the interconnectivity of the militant milieu, because Hadley ultimately migrated over to al-Qaeda, which essentially poached a Lashkar operative. Not the first time, probably not the last time that they've done that. Um, and I'm happy to get into that in the Q&A. Here, I'm going to use it as a jumping off point to discuss some of the constraints on Lashkar um, and why that makes it unlikely to replace al-Qaeda in its present incarnation. Um, first, it should be relatively obvious, um, unlike AQC, and, and by the way, here we're moving into sort of the third part of the talk, factors restricting uh, Lashkar's becoming you know, the next al-Qaeda central. Um, Unlike Al-Qaeda Central, whose leaders operate clandestinely, Lashkar controls a robust infrastructure that operates in plain sight, as do its own leaders. Um, this infrastructure and the freedom of movement carries with it a number of benefits the core Al-Qaeda organization does not enjoy uh, in terms of fundraising, recruitment, ability to, pr to promote propaganda quite publicly, etc. But it also serves as a leverage point that can be used to constrain Lashkar's activities, and has been in the past. Um, this doesn't mean um, Lashkar won't contribute clandestinely to terrorist attacks against Western targets or fight in Afghanistan, uh, but as one of its uh, senior members explained to me during my last visit, the leadership understands diplomatic pressures on Pakistan, and it understands the red lines that exist for it. And so it's difficult to imagine the group choosing to become the public face of the global jihad in the way al-Qaeda Central is. It's also questionable whether Lashkar, in its present incarnation, 
would have the legitimacy to do so um, for two reasons. First, as you might imagine, this ongoing relationship with the PAC mill, the susceptibility to state pressure, robs Lashkar's leaders of legitimacy in the eyes of a number of jihadists who respect the sacrifices that AQ leaders have made and the forthright manner in which they challenge the US as well as its many allies. Um, this is something Lashkar can't change without incurring huge costs at home by breaking with the Pakistani state. Second, Lashkar is a Pakistani organization. And quite frankly, it's difficult to imagine a number of Arab, group, Arab groups following it for that reason alone. And that's something that Lashkar can't change full stop. Um, finally, you know, I want to come back to you know, Lashkar's ideology, because that would also make it challenging for it to lead the global jihad in its current incarnation. If we think back to the 1990s, Al-Qaeda used America to sort of unify those who wanted to target the near enemy and those who wanted to wage irredentist jihads. To those who wanted to target the near enemy, it said, you know, you're never going to be able to defeat these apostate Muslim regimes so long as they have US backing. Okay, so you need to defeat the US first. And to those who wanted to wage irredentist struggles, it said, look, the US has troops in Saudi Arabia. This is an occupation. They should come first. So that was sort of the pre-9-11 way of unifying these two. And then post-9-11, what Al-Qaeda has done is elevate the near enemy um, you know, sort of to an equal level with the far enemy in, er in order to broaden its inclusiveness. Lashkar still prioritizes India as the main enemy. And it considers it haram or forbidden to attack any Muslim country or government. Um, so it's very difficult to imagine it being able to ideologically provide the type of inclusive leadership that, that Al-Qaeda has sought to provide. And indeed, over the past couple of years, um, this has actually led to ideological competition between lashkar e taiba and Al-Qaeda Central in Pakistan, which brings me to the fourth point of my talk, the Lashkar-Al-Qaeda uh, competition. And um, you know, just not to put too fine a point on it, but the crux of that debate revolves around whether or not to conduct jihad um, in Pakistan against a Muslim but potentially idolatrous government or only abroad, um, i.e. in places like India and Afghanistan, where the enemy is known to be a non-Muslim aggressor. So LET makes a number of claims uh, about al-Qaeda, and I'm just going to cite four of them. First, um, it points out, and here it's not too far away from you know, sort of mainstream Islamic thinking, that accusing another Muslim of apostasy, as al-Qaeda does with the Pakistani regime, is a dangerous practice. And the better course of action is to lead them back on the righteous path, Doing otherwise makes you a tough a tough fury and an apostate yourself. Fine. Second, it says that those who murder Muslims instead of the true enemy, i.e., Christians, Jews, and in LET's case, Hindus, are apostates. So right here we have Al Qaeda. Uh, I'm sorry, Lashkar using some pretty heavy language. It's essentially saying that Al Qaeda, you know, these guys are apostates uh, because of their activities, which is a, a pretty you know heavy type of of, of accusation. Third, they say cooperating with non-Muslims for worldly profit um, makes a Muslim misguided, but not an apostate. Only if Muslims actively fight against other Muslims are they then apostates. It's important to note, I, I talked to Lashkar members about this point, and they said they were essentially trying to explain the Pakistani state's actions, arguing that yes, Pakistan takes aid from America, but they're doing this for worldly profit, and they're not actively fighting against the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. They're only providing indirect assistance to the US. So they are very misguided. And Lashkar disagrees with their politics vehemently and protests against them. But that doesn't make them apostates. And therefore, they can't be fought. So this is sort of a very interesting way in which Lashkar is trying to explain the Pakistani state's behavior and make it ideologically acceptable not to fight them. Fourth. Um, it suggests that fighting the Pakistani government is a distraction from the real jihads in Kashmir, um, the Indian mainland, Afghanistan, and other places where Muslim aggressors are found. Now, um, Al Qaeda responds to these points with several of its own. Um, the, the overarching theme of point one for Al Qaeda's response is you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Okay? Um, it says, look, uh, you've accused people. 
such as Kashmal Atarek, uh, some of you may know, a member of the National Assembly in Pakistan, who's an ardent advocate of women's rights. Um, Omar Abdullah, the chief minister of Jammu and Kashmir, who's a Muslim, to be apostates. Um, and you, you know, our attacks, Al-Qaeda says, against the Pakistani state are no different than your Lashkar attacks against government forces in Indian-held ca Kashmir, where you sanction killings of Kashmiri Muslim politicians. So you're doing the same thing we're doing. Um, second, they say, you're wrong. Anybody who helps, supports, or even condones aggression by non-Muslims towards Muslims should suffer the same consequences um, as you know, non-Muslim aggressors. In short, there's no difference between working for profit and actively fighting. Um, they also argue that they're attacking Pakistan not just um, in terms of its support for uh, you know, America's fight in Afghanistan, but also the bombardment of American drones, which Pakistan has provided assistance for, and also for attacks by the Pakistan army in Fatah. And it then essentially calls out uh, Lashkar um, in, in, in a, a tome that was published sort of rebutting a lot of Lashkar's points and says, um, it calls them out saying, you're making these arguments as a result of your relationship with the state saying that its leaders, Lashkar's leaders, want to protect their sources of government funding. So I, you guys are in this for worldly profit, too. Um, and the implication is that you're drawing these distinctions to avoid criticism um, for its support of the Pakistani government. Finally, um, Al-Qaeda argues um, that fighting against the Pakistani state is not a distraction from the jihad against the unbelievers but is intrinsically connected to it because it results in the disruption of American operations in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and possibly elsewhere. And it's, it's arguably the case that you know, the fact that, that, that Pakistan is facing an insurgency at home has led it um, in part to triage and provide priority for fighting those jihadist groups that are attacking it as opposed to taking on those groups that aren't. Um, you know, and that, that has helped complicate the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. So, you know, Al-Qaeda isn't necessarily wrong from that strategic vantage point, unfortunately, though that may be. So to, to conclude, um, you know, my sort of the, the fifth part of my talk and, and launch us into, you know, the Q&A, what does this mean for Lashkar um, and the threat it poses? Um, first, uh, you know, again, it should be obvious, it's, it's very unlikely that the Pakistani state is going to turn on LET in the short term. I mean, this is a group that not only, you know, as a policy is not attacking it, but is actively promoting an ideology to try to beat back those who are. There's evidence to suggest that there's collusion between the Pak Mill and Lashkari Taiba um, in terms of framing some of those ideological messages. All right. There's also evidence to suggest that at times, Lashkari Taiba members have uh, contributed intelligence uh, that has helped um, the army or ISI uh, take out some of those militants who are attacking the Pakistani state. And there's at least you know, one or two instances that I know of in which Lashkar members were involved in what might be considered sort of direct action, where they themselves um, in, you know, attacked you know, one of these groups. Now, at the same time, um, and this is one of the things that I was there researching this summer, um, there's evidence that factions or freelancers within Lashkar are complicit in attacks against the Pakistani state. All right? um, and there's, um, there's no doubt that it's at least cooperating with some of uh, AQ allies uh, in Afghanistan. So what's happening there? How do we sort of square that, that circle? Um, you know, and, and here, you know, sort of what it comes down to is, is those tensions that I spoke about within LET. Um, and it's unclear whether the leadership is at times looking the other way when some of its members are engaging in operations with al-Qaeda, whether they're unaware of it, whether people are leaving and then are being welcomed back into the sort of, quote, big tent. You know, if you ask people in Pakistan, have Lashkar members ever been involved in violence against the state? People, you know, cops, people in the army and the ISI, intelligence bureau sometimes will tell you, you know, off the record, yes, but then they're very quick most of the time to add, but they were former Lashkar members, right? No current Lashkar member's ever been involved in an attack against the Pakistani state. The minute it happens, the guy wasn't in LAT anymore. And it's very difficult to imagine, you know, to, to, to figure out whether they really had left or whether that is sort of their, their own plausible deniability. What's important also to note is the personal connections that exist, the desire to 
avoid splintering means that some of these guys, even though they do leave, still get help from elements within Lashkar Taiba, which means that that infrastructure that Pakistan is sort of protecting is at times being used against it. Um, so, you know, that 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 is, I think, a, a very important type of, of contradiction to, to try to wrestle with. Um, and it's one that my sense is the Pakistani state is be, is is becoming aware of, but hasn't yet really, you know, um, at least um, in terms of the officials that I've spoken to, they're aware of it. But there's not there's no real strategy forward on what to do about it. Leaving aside Lashkar's sort of geopolitical utility um, uh, as well, um, you know. So what does this mean in terms of the Lashkar threat? Well, first, as I said, infrastructure is being used against the the, the Pakistani state. Um, second, um, you know it. It means that you know, because Lashkar continues to uh, present a you know proxy utility against India, that, that that threat remains as well. Third, what's probably of most interest to people in this room is what does it mean in terms of the threat to the U.S. and its allies? And here's where I promise to sort of conclude this. Um, and I think the first point that it's important to make there is that it's important to remember Lashkar is not ideologically opposed to attacks against America or its allies. Right? This is about sort of strategic prioritization, not that it's not precluded ideologically. Um, second, I think it's important to point out that you know, at this stage, it, it, it still appears that the ISI is constraining you know, Lashkar Taiba in terms of uh, attacks transnationally. Um, certainly was in, in you know, the sense that I got when I was there in, in July, um, although that is a much debated point. But you know, it's also, I'd be loath not to, to point out that if relationships between America and, and, and Pakistan really, I mean, deteriorate and fall apart, and the ISI were to loosen that leash, um, you know, then Lashkar could increase its involvement in the global jihad with a bit more of a clear conscience. Um, and I think that's something that, that obviously um, US and Pakistan are, are at this point, you know, hopefully looking to, to avoid happening. Uh, but it's also important to note that, you know, as one uh, Lashkar leader said to me this summer, uh, you know, if Pakistan ever decides that uh, America is its enemy, LET will be there. You know, so um, now at present, as I said, you know, we we sense that there might be some some pressure on the leadership, um, you know, to to restrain itself. But there's obviously pressure on the leadership internally to push the envelope against America and its allies to make up for its conservatism vis-a-vis -vis fighting against Pakistan. Um, this actually helps to explain the Mumbai attacks. Um, you know, it also helps to explain Lashkar's possibly expanding role in Afghanistan. One of the things that I picked up this summer is there appears to be a pipeline running directly from Mansara into Kunar and Nuristan province. That suggests a, a desire to allow LAT militants to access that conflict zone without having to travel through Fatah and mix with all those groups that are attacking the Pakistani state. But you're creating a pressure valve so these guys can still be active, right? Um, and it's also important to note that, that Lashkar has a history of providing ad hoc support for you know, terrorist attacks against the US um, and allied targets, and at times has shown itself willing to, to directly uh, attack them as well. Uh, and I'll briefly just tick off its capabilities, which most people are probably familiar with. Those transnational networks that I mentioned, um, you know, very good uh, training capabilities in Pakistan, especially in the areas of sort of uh, small arm, you know, small unit tactics and explosives expertise. As we saw with the 2008 Mumbai attacks, patient, uh, thoughtful reconnaissance. It's got a lot of money, which it can throw at attacks. Um, it can provide logistical support, so it doesn't have to be on the front end of an attack. Um, and we've seen that potentially with the shoe bomber. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that LAT was involved in providing some low-level logistical support. Also, the uh, 2006 liquid uh, attempt to use liquid explosives to blow up some transatlantic airliners. Um, so all of those areas provide ways in which LAT can act. Um, further, if it fails to act, uh, individuals or factions within it might use the group's uh, capabilities to pursue their own operations. And as I mentioned, because the group's former members don't always cut ties with it, its alumni network um, can pose a threat uh, as well using that infrastructure. So look, the, the bottom line, and I'll conclude here, is however the group evolves, it's not going to be into Al-Qaeda 2.0 for all of the reasons that I outlined. Um, and it's worth reiterating that at present, again, biggest threat remains to India and hence to the stability of South Asia. Uh, but when considering the threat to the US and allies, 
we have to consider not only sort of its intent and its strategic prioritization, but also those capabilities that I highlighted. Um, Lashkar-e Taiba can provide in many ways the operational sinews for the global jihad, and it can do it in a clandestine manner. And that makes it, you know, sort of a, a, a threat that's worth considering today and a potentially, you know, greater one, um, you know, tomorrow. Uh, so again, that's not to say it is going to be the next AQ, not what I'm saying. It is to say a group we're going to continue to keep our eyes on, you know, I think for the foreseeable future. So I'll end there and we can get into Q&A. Great. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, I see a lot of known troublemakers in the audience, and I really am uh, excited to have you ask Stephen hard questions. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the first. Um, and, and that is about this, this notion of Pakistani support to a range of militant groups and their reactions. I mean, you talked a little bit about these groups that are attacking the state and, and folks like LET that have rejected that, that notion despite uh, some Pakistani support for U.S. operations in Afghanistan in, in one respect or another. It strikes me that at least at times there is a third category, and al-Qaeda elements have made this argument um, occasionally, Zawahiri and Abu Yahya Libby have at times said, you know what, the Pakistani state, they've completely gone off the deep end. And you know what, they were always off the deep end because they embraced democracy and those, those sorts of things. So you've got Pakistan's, um, Pakistan has essentially played with fire for a long time. Mm -hmm. And they've started to get burned over the last decade in a, in a very serious way. And I'm wondering what you think the now... I don't know if we can say imminent at this point, but 2014 withdrawal of most of the coalition from Afghanistan, how that will change the dynamic between uh, these various militant networks in Pakistan and how the ISI or the PAC-MIL will respond to that dynamic and, and attempt to manipulate the militant environment uh, after the withdrawal? Um, one, I think, you know, Provided that there is still violence in, in Afghanistan, and I think, unfortunately, um, we would all agree that, that there's, we're probably not going to see peace break out um, you know, a, as soon as the U.S. begins its drawdown. Um, you know, to a degree, we'll see a, you know, a, 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 a continued a sort of continuation of, of what we're seeing today, um, mm -hmm. which is some groups continuing to be supported by the Pakistani state to, to serve its interests in Afghanistan, those groups uh, in turn working with other groups that um, may become somewhat emboldened uh, to attack, to escalate their attacks against the Pakistani state, particularly, and this is something that Pakistanis are concerned about, you know, if they're able to, you know, create better safe haven for themselves on the Afghan side of the border and move back and forth to launch attacks on both sides, um, you know, and we'll con continue to see sort of that circle where Pakistan is supporting, you know, the Haqqani network, um, you know, which has relations with Tariq -e Taliban Pakistan and, you know, elements that sort of operate under the Punjabi Taliban umbrella, some of whom are occasionally being used on the Afghan side of the border or are coming and asking to fight on the Afghan side of the border um, and are also then coming back and launching attacks on the Pakistani side of the border. Um, and I think we'll continue to see what we've seen for a while, which is, you know, an attempt at arbitration. Um, and I think we've seen that with you know, Pakistan's response. Yes, Al-Qaeda might have said, you guys are beyond the pale. And publicly, Pakistan might have said, you know, some of these groups need to be defeated completely. But, you know, I think what we've seen privately is an attempt to sort of play groups off against one another. That's been the historic approach, mm -hmm. um, you know, including with the TTP. Uh, you know, even now you have sort of good TTP and bad TTP. I mean, to the degree that we can refer to the Turkey Taliban Pakistan as one entity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there will continue to be a lot of arbitration. And one of the things that I, you know, came away with, um, I spent a month in Pakistan looking at the threat to the, the main thing that I was looking at was the threat to the Pakistani state from Pakistani militant groups. I wasn't interested so much in the threat that these groups posed abroad. I was really interested in the threat they posed to Pakistan. I wanted to understand what that meant in terms of a constraint on Pakistan's action and if it really was one. One of the things I came away um, somewhat, you know, I, I don't want to say convinced, but, but came away believing more is that I don't get the sense that, that this is viewed within the security establishment as necessarily an existential threat to Pakistan. You know, I think to a degree this is seen as it's a threat that needs to be taken seriously, 
But if taken seriously, it's a threat that can be managed. Mm -hmm. And it can be managed by, by playing group one group off against another, through arbitration, through intelligence-led operations, through extrajudicial action. Um, you know, and that while whereas we may see the violence that's going on in Pakistan as completely unacceptable, to Pakistan, this is, you know, they are, I don't want to say that this is an acceptable level of violence for them, but they are going to manage it rather than, you know, sort of turning against all of these groups. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go to a few questions? I've got a million more, but I'll interject later. Yeah. Um, and wait for Jennifer in the back. Why don't you come up to the front, Jennifer, and we'll start up here and, and work our way back. So we'll go here and, and then you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Raghbir Goyal with India Globe in Asia today. Uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was just in Pakistan, and she thought that relations will improve with Pakistan because of her visit, but again, so many things happened. My question is that, one, can Pakistan control these LET or Haqqani network and so forth? What message do you have for India and for the United States now, the future of these groups in Pakistan, if Pakistan doesn't control them or if they have capability? Thanks. Um. I, I've said this before, um, and it's it's you know it, it sounds somewhat flip, but I think it's it's true. I think Pakistan has more control over groups uh, like the Haqqani Network um, and Lashkar -e Taiba than it admits publicly, and a lot less than it would like to have in reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's I, I think that's probably a fair way of saying it. I think you know one of the things that that, that Particularly with 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 Lashkar, since uh, I think the Mumbai attacks in two thousand and eight, you know there was that that moment where there was a question, um, you know, will they really crack down this time, or will they decide to double down and try to just regain control over Lashkar Taiba? Um, you know, and my sense is that it's been the latter, right? Um, you know, most people s suggested that the crackdown was going to be. For anybody who's seen the movie Groundhog Day, it was going to be somewhat like that. It was going to be like crackdowns past. It was going to be somewhat. Uh, cosmetic, and, and it turned out to be, in, in large part, cosmetic. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's continued attempts to regain control, um, you know, and, and my concern is, uh, you know, that, that managing jihadists is, is more art than science, right? Um, and, you know, I, you, you don't get the sense that, that control can be... Um, interminable, that, that, that will last forever. Uh, and I will add on that, you know, I think in particular with regard to Lashkar Taiba, because it tells us something about the dynamics of how this works, you know, my sense is that this was less about regaining control of the leadership. I don't think the leadership was ever out of control. I think this was more about regaining control over some of the um, people within the ISI who were handling Lashkar Taiba and had allowed Mumbai to, to happen the way it did. And then helping Lashkar's leaders to try to regain control over their own organization. And that tells us something about, A, the type of approach that the Pakistani state is going to try to take. B, you know, it suggests that, great, in the short term, you can help regain control over elements, factions within the organization. But that only lasts for so long. And it only lasts as long as you can give them an outlet in Afghanistan. Um, and it only lasts as long as you can convince them that they shouldn't be lured away by people, you know, in Al Qaeda or others who are saying, "Listen, you know, the Pakistani state has always been beyond the pale." Um, and I've argued before, and I would argue again that that so long as militancy sort of remains a buyer's market in Pakistan, which is to say, if you wanna if you wanna fight against the Shia, you can find a group or groups to do that with. If you want to fight against the state, you can find a group or groups to do that with. If you want to fight against India, you can find a group or groups to do that with. If you want to fight in Afghanistan, you know, so long as that remains the case and individuals are moving around, um, you can maybe manage things so that there's not a conflagration, but you're going to continue to get slippage, right? Either at home or abroad. So why don't we start here, Jennifer? 
Hi, Mr. Tankel. I'm Julia Nouri from Voice of America, Afghan TV. You have been on our show. I, my question is, uh, there was an article today in the New York Times uh, about this uh, group, Lashkar Jangavi, uh, behind this bomb blast in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, which happened mm -hmm. against this uh, Shia shrine in Afghanistan, which is in Afghanistan, Shia and Sunni doesn't have too much things. But when it, this thing happened, it's basically, what do you think about link between Lashkar Jangavi and Lashkar Taiba, and how do you see these attacks? I don't see real links between LEJ um, and Lashkar Taiba. I do see links between Lashkar Jangvi and a lot of the other Diobandi militants um, in Pakistan. And I think it's, in, I mean, I, you know, look, we're here to talk about LET, but I think it, we can certainly, I'm happy to engage on, on LEJ for a second. One of the things I was looking at this summer was sort of um, what the new militant nexus looks like, right? We use all these terms for some of these Diobandi militant groups Lashkar Jangvi, Jaish Muhammad, Harakat al Mujahideen, Harakat al Jihad Islami questionable how much utility they really have. We're talking about groups as they existed in 2002, 2003. There's a whole new network of actors right now that are you know, tangentially related to the infrastructure that these, that these actors had. And in Lushkri Jungvi's place, you know, um, that group as it existed, I think, in 2002, 2003, it doesn't exist the same way anymore. You know, it's very difficult to pin down exactly how it exists. You get different answers. But one of the things that I heard is, if there's a leadership, you know, they're, with, they're in North Waziristan, right? But we're not sure there's a leadership. And it might just be that you have a lot of different cells. And it's questionable whether they really are trying to be part of a political movement. You know, one of the things that Lashkar Taiba wants is reformism in Pakistan. What Lashkar Jungvi has historically wanted is to kill the Shia, right? I mean, that, 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 has, that was their sort of raison d'etre in the 1990s. Um, and to a degree, um, because they were one of the first groups that the state really did turn on after 2002, it had already started to turn on them by that point, um, and really did crack down on them more so than others, you know, it's not surprising that they also quite close with those who are waging revolutionary jihad uh, you know, in Pakistan. And so you get sort of this nexus between fighting against the near enemy, fighting against the Shia. Several uh, Tariqi Taliban Pakistan leaders came out of Lashkar Jungvi. Okay? Um, LEJ you know, has, is able to tap into, uh, sorry to throw like another group at everybody, but Sipa -e Sahaba Pakistan is the sort of the above ground uh, political wing that it had split off of. They can still tap into SSP, mosques, Madaras, etc. And so they can have a nationwide presence. So is it surprising to me, you know, do, do I, can I confirm or, you know, say that LEJ definitely was responsible in Afghanistan? No, but is it surprising to me that they, you know, are sort of infecting um, these other groups with that sectarianism, that sectarian agenda? No, that, that's not surprising. And I think that that's a threat that a lot of Pakistanis actually are aware of is the threat from sectarianism. Um, you know, and, and certainly if that's now moving to a greater degree than hitherto over the last 10 years to, to Afghanistan as well, you know, well then we can just add another reason why things look you know, a bit more bleak there. Jennifer, I want to go here. Hi, I, Ira Weiss. I'm not affiliated with anyone. Uh, Question, you were talking about a dialogue, uh, you described something that sounds like a dialogue between Al-Qaeda and lashkar taiba concerning the theological uh, justifications for different kinds of attacks. Where does this dialogue take place? What kind of media does this dialogue, and, and do, they actually, do they actually refer to the other organization in this dialogue? Um, so this, this dialogue is taking place in, in multiple forums. Um, one, and I can speak more to the, to the Lashkar Taiba end than, than to the Al Qaeda end. One, Lashkar Taiba is holding seminars and symposiums throughout the country for its members to try to re inculcate in them this we don't fight against our fellow Muslims type of ideology. Um, and that, that's from current and former members of the group who've told me you know, about these. Um, they're, they're preaching that at times in their Friday sermons in mosques. You know, they're working through mullahs that they have in different areas throughout the country to do that. Some of their ideological leaders are going out and doing road shows as well, if you will. Um, you know, they're also making radio cassettes, and they're you know, um, and they're you know, they're publishing things online and forums, and they're also you know, publishing sort of electronic books right now. Um, some of the points that I was making are drawn from an Al Qaeda response, which was a book-length response, um, you know, that was distributed electronically. 
um, you know, that was given to me by a, a militant in Pakistan, you know, who I was talking to about this, who said, listen, this will give you a pretty good sense. And in that, you know, Al-Qaeda literally says, um, we are responding to, you know, um, Sheikh X's talk in, you know, I don't remember where it was offhand, and here are the points that, you know, Lashkar Taiba has made, and here are how we respond to them. And those who follow sort of some of these jihadist debates will know that it's not uncommon to get people writing book length, this is my responses to that person, and then somebody else will publish, this is my responses to that person's responses. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot, so, and, and there's a lot of it that is, um, you know, pulling on Islamic history and a lot of, you know, arcane theological debates. But there is also, you know, as I tried to point out here, some, some quite, kind of cutting much more, you know, uh, today issue type of stuff in terms of like, listen, you guys are on the Pakistani government's dime. And so, of course, you're saying that, right? So, yeah. So that's, that's how those debates are happening. Jennifer, can we go back there, actually? Uh, Elaine Sorayo. I'm very interested in a uh, sort of a previous uh, presentation here at the New America Foundation regarding uh, a role of, of fostering economic ties between Pakistan and India and how that can, is that, do you see this being uh, thwarted or even sabotaged via uh, interests within Pakistan who support L.E.T., who may be orchestrating things with L.E.T. to, to you know, make sure that this sort of process, this sort of progress or step or one step forward, two steps back or that kind of thing does not happen. Sure. Let me let me speak uh, first sort of directly to the, to the question of, of most favored nation status, you know, uh, Pakistan's, you know, uh, you know, reported decision to grant MFN to India, um, which was, you know, a particularly a long time coming. Uh, this, you know, if it goes through and economic ties between the two improve is a good thing. I mean, you know, in an area where we're often talking about bad things, I mean, this is a good thing. Um, and it's a good thing for a number of reasons. One, you know, I'm not an economist. Um, you know, but from those who I've spoken to or I've read, if you, you know, run the numbers, this, you know, this could be good for both countries economically. And certainly, you know, Pakistan could, could use some, some, you know, economic benefits right now in the form of, as they always say, trade, not aid, right? So, um, so that in and of itself is, is a good thing. Look, one of the reasons why MFN, had, you know, took so long to go through was, um, you know, and again, if you talk to, to people in Pakistan, they'll tell you because there were those in the security establishment who didn't want to see it go through. Um, you know, either because they thought that Pakistan was going to get a, 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 you know, a raw deal from it or because they thought that there shouldn't be any type of engagement along these lines until, you know, Kashmir is settled or, or you know, what have you. Um, if, you know, a, a, economic ties improving, that moving forward, all of that is good. Now, as to sort of Lashkar's role as a spoiler or to the desire of people in Pakistan to use it as a spoiler, be it for, you know, improving economic ties or improving ties of any other sort as you spoke to, yeah, there's certainly, um, you know, I think there's certainly concern about that. Uh, you know, one of the questions that I asked outright to, um, to, to not just current members of, of Lashkar Taiba, but also, you know, a former senior official who recently left for, for personal reasons, which means that, you know, he doesn't necessarily disagree with the group's, uh, you know, raison d'etre. He, he had personal issues with people. I said, what do you think, you know, Lashkar would do, um, you know, if, if the Pakistani state wanted to find a political solution to Kashmir? You know, and he said, you know, his sense was, and you have to remember, he's speaking to a Western researcher who, who knows has written a book about this, which, you know, I mean, we had a very collegial discussion over four or five hours, but, you know, there's still, you know, we have to take into account the biases that exist in terms of the interview or the discussion, right? But he said, you know, his sense was, if they wanted to find a political solution, would the leadership, you know, sort of, is it mature enough to abide by that? You know, his sense was yes, and I've heard that from others, but it's very difficult to know, and I want to put a very fair, fine point on this, if that's a message that they're trying to send 
to Western interlocutors or whether that's really the case. Because certainly one of the concerns has been either that the Lashkar leadership would try to spoil any type of political solution or you know, that elements within the group could. And I would add on to that, you know, I think there's also a fair, a fair case to be made that in the Indian and Pakistani security establishment on both sides of the border, there are those, there are, you know, potential spoilers exist. Um, and if you want to, you know, use a group to spoil the peace or, you know, a peace process, Lashkar is a pretty good one, right? So that just makes it all the more difficult. And also, by the way, makes it all the more unlikely that Lashkar is going to be dismantled before you get any type of peace. Because quite frankly, you know, why would Pakistan give up that kind of leverage at the negotiating table in advance? Sure. Uh, Steve, nice yeah, to see you again. See you again. Uh, my name is Kami but uh, I am with the Pakistani Spectator. And I'm sorry to repeat my question, the question that I asked you a few months ago, that where I could Se get several, some money. Several, several yeah, forums, actually. To, to yeah. write a book about Kashmir, uh, you know, there were thousands of uh, graveyard discovered in Indian Kashmir, and some of peop those people were buried alive. Do you think that least Lashkar Taiba crazy and stupid people are more violent than what's going on in Indian Kashmir? Or what's going on as a matter of fact in Pakistani Balochistan, where Paki army is killing hundreds of Baloch. So I mean, where I could get this money uh, and write about these issues? And I think I agree with you that these people are violent. Uh, religion does inspire violence. There is no doubt about okay. this. But see, I'm a Punjabi, I'm a Kashmiri, I'm a Paki. And I refuse to accept okay. that somehow okay. these people are. You've asked me this okay. question before. No, 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 listen, so listen. Actually, in several uh, forums. Listen, so see, I, can, I can respond to it. I um, refuse to accept this you know premises that somehow we are pro genetically violent it the same premises so, uh, that 20 okay. years ago in this city Sir. people thought about blacks okay you know Sir, first thank of all, you. No, um, listen i mean there no, should be no, some no, balance i i, I, I completely Sir, i completely take your point um yeah, I, I would like to point out yeah yeah no no I, first of all um i never made that statement i i know that i think no, you came in Sir, sir, you, sir, please sit down. So you've had a chance to ask your question. That's enough. Okay. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'm happy to try to respond to that um, as as best as I can. Um, and I, you've asked me this question in I think every forum that I've I've ever spoken at. Uh, so you'd think I'd be well practiced at it by this point. Um, one, uh, you know, at, at no point did I suggest in, in any way, shape, or form that, uh, you know, there is anything uh, Islamic about terrorism or that, you know, that there's, that, that, that there's anything. That all religions have violence in them, okay? We can find Christian extremists, Jewish extremists, um, Muslim extremists. I've, I've actually, you know, at another think tank, uh, published a paper looking at the similarities between, you know, in extremism among the three Abrahamic faiths. So, you know, sort of my record in terms of looking at this uh, cross-faith is pretty good. Um, secondly, I, I'm not sure. I think you might have come in late, so you didn't really hear what the subject of my talk was about. Um, th that Leave that aside. Third, your question about Kashmir, there have been a lot of great books written about Kashmir. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't written any of them. Um, there were no books written about Lashkar Taiba, so I decided to write that one. I think if you think there should be another book written about Kashmir, then you should go ahead and write it. Um, after I get through publishing my thesis and a couple of other articles and books, um, you know, if I see space in that market, I'm happy to look at it. But to your overall question, um, you know, Lashkar Taiba, one of the reasons why it's interesting to me is it is a symptom of a much wider problem, okay? And it is a problem in which no side is innocent, okay? It's impossible to get around the fact that the Pakistani state has supported terrorist groups, you know, at times, all right, ha, you know, has given support to, to militant organizations, chief among them, you know, LET. Um, it's impossible to get around the fact that that Lashkar Taiba is, is an Islamist organization, or that Pakistan, for primarily nationalist purposes, has instrumentalized 
that Islamist sentiment for its own purposes. It is also important to get around the fact that the Kashmir conflict that erupted in 1989 erupted, you know, for the most part, as a result of indigenous grievances, all right, because of serious mismanagement and neglect by the Indian government. And I think, as you have pointed out, it's relatively well documented that there, you know, that there were, you know, significant human rights violations committed by Indian security forces, um, you know, in Indian administered Kashmir. Both sides have blood on their hands. So, you know, I thank you for pointing that out. I think that's an important point to be made. But, you know, you've pointed that out on, on numerous occasions, and I, I always take that point. Um, so I think that's an important thing for all of us to remember here. Uh, I, don't, I don't really go much beyond that with, you know, with answering your, your statement. OK. Um, the, yes, sir. Uh, Fadi Boris Fatemi with Oxford Chart Group. Can I just follow up what the gentleman talked about on Kashmir? Because it seems to me in these kinds of forums, we talk about Our, every, I'm sorry, what? In these kinds of forums that yeah. we have, we talk about everything except Kashmir. Now, if Kashmir did not exist, would the Pakistanis need the Lashkars? After they lost three wars to India, their decision was that the only way to fight India over the Kashmir situation <coughs> was to create these irregular groups. Yeah. India, on the other hand, to counteract this, is doing all it can in the northwest frontier in Afghanistan and to, to gin up all the problems that they can create for the Pakistanis to counteract this. So as long as Kashmir exists, can we talk about these things without really talking about Kashmir? I think the foreign policy establishment has totally forgotten that when you talk to a Pakistani, this is very deep in their heart as a Kashmiri as to what has happened in these past 60 or so years as this conflict has gone on. Um, I'm gonna, I, I, I think it's a very valid point. Um, let me say this about Kashmir. First, um, my sense is that, that there should be a, that India and Pakistan should settle their territorial dispute um, over, over Kashmir um, because it would be good for India, because it would be good for Pakistan, and because it would be good for the Kashmiris. Um, and at this stage, they deserve some, some sort of settlement. And they should do that, I mean, above and beyond whether or not, you know, the, the states do things for geopolitical utility. Um, but, but leaving Lashkar aside, you know, for that reason alone, you know, it is worth settling. Um, I, I would also say that settling Kashmir is going to be part and parcel to any type, of, any sort of real peaceful reconciliation between the two countries, OK? And there's a bit of a chicken and egg in terms of how that's going to work. So I think that's something that's all well accepted. You know, I think there are and continue to be questions about you know, what role outside interlocutors could play in terms of uh, promoting that process. I myself have said I don't think that the US can play a role in terms of forcing both sides to the table. But it can provide something of a safety net once talks start to keep them from devolving. Okay, and I think that's an important role that you know the U.S. and international uh, interlocutors can play. Now, is settling Kashmir uh, going to mean the end of Lashkar -e Taiba? My sense is it's necessary, but not sufficient. Okay, I don't think that we should believe that if Kashmir were settled on Tuesday, that LET would be demobilized on Wednesday. All right. Lashkar -e Taiba provides other types of utility to the Pakistani state. All right. One, um, you know, at the moment it provides, you know, it's not a major player in Afghanistan, but, you know, it's another group that's active there. Uh, two, it continues to provide some sort of leverage vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, India. Now that may want to use that leverage to settle Kashmir, it's possible. Three, um, there is this sense, I think it's potentially uh, somewhat misguided, but that, you know, Lashkar's many trained members could act as some sort of an auxiliary force in the event that there were war between India and Pakistan. Right. Four, um, what I was speaking about during, you know, sort of much of the talk today is they provide domestic utility as well um, against some of these other groups. Right. I mean, it's not just we don't want to go after a group that isn't attacking us. This is a group that promotes an ideology that others shouldn't be attacking us. Uh, and then five, we shouldn't overlook the fact that it provides enormous social welfare utility as well. OK, um, that's not to overstate it. 
uh, I think one of the things that I, you know, I and many others, and I, you know, I did this in my book, and I think others have done this as well, is to promote this concept of, of, of you know, the above ground Jamaat Dawa, like they've got an office in every single district, right, and they're the world's biggest relief agency. It, they're not, but they have penetrated pockets of the population. They help deliver vote banks for politicians. Okay, um, if you close down all their madaras. All their hospitals, you got to replace that with something else. Keep in mind, you're then putting out a lot of workers as well. There are a lot of other more complicated reasons, you know, beyond, I mean, Kashmir is plenty complicated, that you have to get into when you talk about how you end Lashkar Taiba. And it probably ends, you know, at this stage, what people are talking about is with some sort of transition to a nonviolent entity rather than, you know, smashing it into a million pieces, right? So, you know, again, that's to come back to. Does that mean that, that, we sh that, that we shouldn't be encouraging and that Pakistan and India shouldn't be seeking some sort of settlement to Kashmir? They absolutely should be, and we should encourage that. Is that going to immediately trigger a demobilization of Lashkar Taiba and other groups? No, I, I don't think it necessarily is. Again, necessary, most likely, but probably not sufficient. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, Samar Chatterjee from Safe Foundation. Uh, Stephen, um, I think it's interesting that the Kashmir came up. <laughs> uh, maybe you should write a book on <laughs> Kashmir. <laughs> the reason is, uh, I mean, I'm originally from India. I was born, but I'm an American citizen. But the way I see the Kashmir problem, uh, it should be considered settled as is, uh, which means uh, those people in the Indian, uh, so-called Indian occupied Kashmir or Indian Kashmir, uh, who are being terrorized by the Indian military, uh, because India is at war. I mean, just as United States is at war in Iraq or Afghanistan, <laughs> India is at war in that part of Kashmir. Uh, they should pack up and go across the border. The border is very close and live peacefully and in a very humane uh, treatment in the Pakistani side, which probably isn't the case, but they should. Uh, because in most of, most of India, there are enough Muslims in various parts of India, and they're still living in peace with a few eruption here and there once in a, uh, once in a blue moon, uh, which always happens because of this et ethnic conflict. So the Kashmir can be settled that way, uh, which means one part of Kashmir stays in India, which means India also has a claim that the whole Kashmir was in its possession till Pakistan illegally took part of Kashmir. Would you study that and make that point clear to your Pakistani friends since you lived in Pakistan for a uh, while? Uh, a couple things. One, I never lived in Pakistan. Two, um, I have studied that. Three, I think um, there would be plenty of people in Pakistan, perhaps some in India. Certainly, I, I would assume some in this room who would probably disagree with you. Um, if, the, if somebody from Pakistan were to stand up and, and were to promote what their vision of the conflict is, it would be quite different. Um, unfortunately, and I have been to track to you know, events and other dialogues where we talked about Kashmir for several days. I know it's surprising after those fora still haven't sorted out the problem. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it in the minute or two. I could try to address your statement. So, Do we have any other questions? Non-Kashmir specific <laughs> questions. I think we've covered that one. <laughs> Sir, right there yeah, on the aisle. Hey, uh, Kyle Green, I'm a grad student at George Mason University. Uh, some of my research in, uh, in looking into terrorist organizations, particularly in East Asia, leads me to uh, believe that there are some kind of communications between Aleph and LET, and that LET is moving towards more of an intellectually based terror network, particularly in their dealings with uh, educational institutions in Lahore. Have you found that in your research? Um, with I'm sorry, with which group? With Aleph, the uh, formerly the uh, sarin gas Tokyo people. Right. Um, I haven't seen that. I, I here's what I can say about sort of LET's you know, sort of communications and its international connections. Um, one, uh, you know, the group not only has those transnational networks that I mentioned, which, which suggests nodes in those various areas. I mean, some of their operatives have traveled, you know, almost globally. Um, and so, ha you know, may have created, you know, ad hoc connections with who knows which individuals where. Um, certainly in Southeast Asia, there was, you know, there were connections with uh, Gemma Islamiyah. Um, we knew that some guys from JI were, were you know, captured, um, you know, at, at I think at a Lashkar uh, Madrasa, 
in like 2002, 2003. One of them was related to, I think, was the brother of Hambali, who was the uh, person behind the 2002 Bali uh, blast. Um, you know, in addition, the group has a um, you know, sort of an external affairs department, um, which is responsible for connecting with uh, both sort of above ground Islamist organizations as well as it's got an operational wing that has been connecting with militant groups uh, you know, around the world. Uh, for the most part, these have been groups that, that would be considered, quote, jihadist. Um, but in certain instances, Lashkar, you know, has been suspected of reaching out to, uh, you know, to, 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 to other groups, you know, for strategic purposes. The one that the most comes to mind is I've never heard anything with, with, with the folks in, you know, uh, with the left. Uh, what I've heard is the Maoists, um, you know, in, in uh, India, um, you know, and this, I've heard from somebody in LET, you know, even he says, yes, there might have been some attempt to, quote, shake hands with them, you know, over the fact that both want to hurt India, though it's not clear anything ever came of it. I think this is something that Lashkar Taiba is open to. Uh, certainly, one of the things that we can say about it historically in terms of its evolution is it's shown a propensity to be able to forge allegiances with a host of different actors. Um, when it's needed to. These haven't necessarily been strong binding allegiances, um, but for a group that is so doctrinaire religiously, it, it, it can show its own pragmatism at times. So I'm sorry that I don't know specifically about that, about that group, but I do know that, yes, in general, there have been attempts to sort of build that network. And something that is certainly of concern, and I alluded to this as I was concluding my remarks, is the ability, because of the networks, because its operatives have traveled you know, um, globally, because they, they do quite well in terms of um, IT and communications, um, you know, th they could provide some sort of means for information sharing or coordination at some level. Of course, the thing that's going to potentially get in the way with that is you have to be worried if you're you know, Al-Qaeda about coordinating too much with LIT because if the leadership wants to turn you over, you can. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of separateness and togetherness. And so it's got that potential to play that role. Yes, sir, in the back. Do we have any other questions? Because we should run through one or two here. Uh, Mike Sponder. You mentioned uh, that the Pakistani military feels that they have control, but they'd like more control. But Mubarak felt he had control. Uh, uh, Gaddafi felt he had control. Assad obviously still feels he has control. Uh, how fragile is the Pakistani world because of who can control? And wh what happens if the spokes start spinning again, again nuclear capabilities? Um, Hold on one second. Yeah, sure. Is there any one other one last question? Yes, sir, ma'am. You've been waiting for a while. Why don't you ask it and then hit them sure. both? Okay. Yes. Yeah, my question is about the we'll wait for the mic. Thank you. Hi. My question is about the uh, future of U U.S. and Pakistan relations. And do you still see Pakistan as a serious partner to U.S. Uh, for not being in Bonn uh, about decisions in Afghanistan? And what is the primary source of funding for Lashkar Taiba? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll take the control question first. I think what I said is Pakistan has less control than it would claim publicly and more than it would like and, and not as much as it would have like to have you know in reality so I, I I didn't say that they feel as though they've got complete control um, quite frankly that's it's very difficult to get a sense of what the army or the IS you know what elements in the army and the ISI feel about their you know about their level of control um, I certainly can't quantify how much control they have I don't know if those who are charged with trying to exercise it could really quantify how much control they have. But I could almost guarantee that if they could, they wouldn't tell me. Um, that said, you know, uh, the, is there a concern that, 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 that control attenuates over time or that they don't have as much as they think they do or would like to have? Yes. Absolutely, and that's what I, I, I think I said that before when I was saying that, you know, that this is a bit more art than science, that, um, that you can sort of manage things, but you have to deal with slippage um, because you don't control every, enti you know, every entity all the time. Um, and actions can have immediate impact in terms of 
attacks in, in your own country. And then, you know, attacks abroad can have second and third order impacts on Pakistan as well. And I think they worry about all of that. Um, and I think they have, I think it's fair to say they have more control over, you know, like Lashkar e Taiba than they do over Jaishi Mohammed um, or splinters of Jaishi Mohammed. Um, actually, they've probably got pretty good control over the core of JEM because you can't swing a cat in Bahawalpur without, like, you know, hitting, uh, you know, an ISI agent probably. But, um, you know, but control is, is, it can attenuate. It can be, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to pin down. So your point is quite valid. And I think you hit on one of the key concerns, which is the question about counterproliferation, right? Um, and that's something that I think everybody worries about. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't have an answer for you in terms of, you know, being able to quantify it. Here's what I can say. Um, absent nuclear or, you know, or, or, or chemical materials getting to the hands of, of, a, of a Pakistani group, do I think that any of these groups poses an existential threat to the Pakistani state? I mean, that's really questionable. And absence, they're getting hold of nuclear material, right, or a nuclear weapon and being able to use it. You know, I would argue that, that if you look at what the major threats are to the Pakistani state right now, the things that touch people on a daily basis, potential water shortages, right? It's the fact that you don't have electricity sometimes in some places 12 hours a day. It's employment. It's that you're looking at a youth bulge, you know, in a country where you already have employment problems and education issues. You know, these are the issues that I think, you know, over time are, you know, much in, in some ways much more existential. I mean, you know, people have argued Pakistan has always muddled through and it may still. I'm simply saying those are potentially bigger even than the militant issue. The militant issue is one, again, that comes back to, to the, the, the nuclear question, and I think that's somebody, something that people rightly worry about you know, all the time. It's certainly, and this is a nice segue into the other question, is something that I think the U.S. worries about uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, so to the, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, um, I don't think I need to go over all the reasons why right now it's bad. We all know right now it's bad, right? I mean, um, it's, it's traditionally been, um, you know, for the last 10 years or so, and, and one could argue even before that, it's, it's, been, it's been a relationship built about security issues, and, and that's been primarily it. And for the last 10 years, those security issues have been, I think, first and foremost, you know, and certainly in the last several years, Afghanistan um, and, and the groups fighting there. Secondarily, wider counterterrorism measures, you know, and then thirdly, counterproliferation, the nuclear thing. None of those are going away, though Afghanistan, you know, becomes less pressing after 2014. Um, you know, I have argued and, and would continue to argue that the U.S. needs to have, continue to have some sort of relationship with Pakistan um, because counterterrorism and counterproliferation will remain important for the foreseeable future. And I would argue of the two, counterproliferation is probably the one that, you know, is less in the news on a day-to-day -day basis, but is more important over the long term. Um, you know, I have also argued that, that, you know, I would like to see the U.S. And, and Pakistan building some sort of relationship beyond, you know, sort of the security equation. That looks unlikely right now, right? Um, I think there's a lot of good thinking being done on, on how we relook at aid and trade and all these other things. But right now, that's going to be very difficult. And it's going to be very difficult, you know, because of you know, the, the NATO raid on top of the bin Laden raid on top of Raymond Davis and, you know, all the other things that we could pile into that. Um, you asked about Bonn. Uh, you know, I don't think that is, I don't think I'm the first person to say that's not promising, right? Um, I think it's, from the Pakistani side, you know, I think it's fair to say that there is a sense, and sir, you did allude to it, that Pakistani lives are worth less, you know, than than American lives. I think that is something that the, that the population feels. You know, I don't, I don't agree with that, but I understand why there is that feeling. On the U.S. side, you know, there's the sense that many of the, the problems Pakistan is having, and possibly this, this latest raid itself, is the result of, you know, problems that Pakistan has created for itself, right? And, and there, therein lies, lies the rub. Um, as far as Bonn is concerned, some of that was probably about respect or, you know, the, the security establishment trying to reclaim, uh, you know, its space. One could also argue that some of it might have been about, you know, I, I would question what did Pakistan have to bring to the table in Bonn? You know, was this, did they, you know, not miss an opportunity, did, did they not miss an opportunity to take advantage of a crisis kind of thing? I, I don't know. 
Um, you know, but that I think speaks to the degree to which no, these actors are just not on the same page right now. Um, things will continue to muddle along, I think, you know, at, at the lowest levels for all the reasons that I cited. Um, I would be talking for like another several hours and we could all get into it if we tried to talk about how we go about rebuilding this. I don't, I don't have time for that right now, unfortunately. Neither do you, although I think it's a question that we all need to continue to have. Um, so I'll conclude by answering a much easier question, which was sort of, I think, part C, where does LET get its funding? Uh, mostly domestic. Um, you know, there's this conception that it gets the majority of its funding from, uh, you know, Salafi, you know, actors in, in, in the Gulf. It gets money from the Gulf, and it gets money, I think, from Europe. Um, but I think most of its money, you know, or, or the, the biggest share comes from domestic fundraising, right? And not just from domestic fundraising, but from investments in businesses. Um, you know, this is not, I mean, these, these guys are people who they've invested in, in legitimate enterprises. Um, you know, they've got their fingers in a lot of different pies. Um, that is, from our perspective, in terms of, you know, how we try to deal with the organization, a good thing and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because it means that we can't choke off funding. Um, Lord knows I think people have made valiant attempts at doing so. Um, it's, it's also a bad thing because it means that sort of in that regard our leverage is limited. But it means that the Pakistani government, and I alluded to this earlier, does have some leverage because you can close down those businesses. You can close down that infrastructure if you really wanted to. Now that, that's a double-edged sword as well, but but, 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 but Lashkar Taiba is in, in many ways sort of insinuated itself into the fibers of, 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 of Pakistani society, or at least parts of it. Um, and so that, that suggests that when you try to deal with it, you have to deal with it knowing that, that that's the case. OK. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. I would be perfectly happy to sit here and harangue Stephen all afternoon. Um, but that's not in the cards. Stephen, thank you very much for, for coming. This was thank really wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, and everybody, make sure you pick up a copy of this book, uh, Storming the World Stage, which is for sale outside. And that way, you'll be able to nail him even better next time he's out in public. <laughs> all right. Yeah.